Thank you for joining us this afternoon and welcome to the Leon County Library Lecture Series. I'm the Library's Innovation Officer, Pamela Monroe, and I'm excited to be here introducing this wonderful program. Since the Library Lecture Series was created almost five years ago, it has featured nearly a dozen talented and engaging speakers. From historians, to artists, to authors, and more, we have heard from local, regional, and national speakers who engage and inspire the community with thoughtful discussions about topics in the arts and sciences. And we are so happy to add local illustrator and writer Elizabeth Lampman Davis to that list of speakers. Her lecture today is the kickoff of this year's third annual Cosmicon, our week-long celebration of comic books, graphic novels, gaming, sci-fi, pop culture, and local art. Elizabeth's illustrations, which feature magical and whimsical scenes, celebrate the power and importance of storytelling for people of all ages, but especially children. She takes special care to include children of all backgrounds and abilities so they can see themselves represented in artwork and stories. In 2020, Elizabeth was awarded first place in the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators Rising Kite Illustration Contest for the Florida region. And she had her first solo gallery exhibition earlier this year at the Tallahassee International Airport's Art Port Gallery. Her work is currently on display here at the main library until September 30th. And now please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Lampman Davis. Give us just a second, we're gonna mic her up. Good morning. I'm Elizabeth Lampman Davis. And just so you know, for the hard of hearing, just for this part, I'm going to take my mask off, okay? I promise I'll put it back on when I do the computer part. I'm Liz Davis, as Pam said. Thank you so much for introducing me. And thank you so much to the library for hosting me and my work. Um, let me just switch over here. I was born and raised in South Florida. I graduated from FSU with a degree in creative writing and visual art. And Elizabeth Lampman Davis is my pen name, which is the name that would appear on a book if it were to be published, when, when it gets published. Um, the wonderful folks at the library asked me to, oh, thank you, I have to stay on camera. The wonderful folks at the library asked me to come and talk about illustration and storytelling and um, do a demo for you, which will be really fun. Um, please feel free to ask questions as they come up, um, especially during the demo. Um, and I'll try to do my best to answer them. Um, my love of storytelling and illustration began when I was a child, spending a lot of time at my local library. Um, having my own library card is sort of like having a passport to another world and another time, anywhere that I wanted to go. Um, and I remember taking huge stacks of books home with me, um, so big that I couldn't even carry them. Um, and there isn't much that has changed now that I'm an adult down here. Sorry about that. Thank you. You can still hear me, though. OK. Um, that hasn't really changed now that I'm an adult. I have a huge stack of library books, some of which are overdue, um, on my floor right now. And about half of them are children's books. I love children's books. Um, I love picture books and graphic novels and middle grade novels. And I even read some young adult novels sometimes. Um, the, um, oh, so reading has always sort of informed my drawing. When I was a little kid, I used to write stories and draw pictures and staple them all together and show my mom. I was really proud. Um, and again, now that I'm an adult, not much has changed. I still write stories and draw pictures and I print them out and staple them together and show them to my mom. 
Um, when I became a mom myself, I became a mom through adoption. So my family is multiracial, which means we don't all look the same, and multi-abled, which means we don't all have the same abilities. Um, when I started reading to my kids, because I love to read, uh, they were still babies sitting on my lap. And of course, the first thing I wanted to do was share with them this huge stack of books that were my favorite when I was a kid. Um, but it was, while I always kind of knew that there was a diversity problem in children's literature, it didn't become super personal and relevant until this little kid sitting on my lap, I couldn't give them that big stack of books I wanted to give them. It was just a little stack. And I, I wanted to change that. Um, so for the last several years, in effort to change that, I have been practicing. And um, by practicing, I mean obsessing, obsessing, learning, researching, studying the art of storytelling and illustration, not just for children, but for more children. Um, there, there are a few books out there that represent families and children that look like mine, um, a few. And there are even fewer that are really high quality, really good. The ones that do exist are often heavy on preaching and lesson learning and challenges, um, but they lack imagination and magic and fun and silliness uh, that mark the books that I grew up with that I love so much, that children love. <clears throat> There's of course a place in children's literature for books that teach you things. But what I really wanted to add to children's literature is books that are fun and silly and magical and beautiful. And they just happen to feature families who are blended, families who are multi-abled, just doing their thing, being a family. It doesn't have to be about the fact that they look different or act differently. I wanna make books look like this. I want to make books like this because I want children, all children to see themselves in those books and feel powerful and important and proud. And then I also want children who get to see themselves in books more often to get to see from somebody else's perspective and develop empathy and understanding. Just as books have formed who I became, I think for me, by illustrating and writing, I might get to become, become a little part of what somebody else becomes when they grow up. And that's a huge privilege and a responsibility. I hope someday to be traditionally published. I'll be honest, being traditionally published is incredibly hard. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> really hard. Um, you can work on a book you love and believe in for two years three years, dream about it at night, and then send it off. And in three minutes, get a curt, impersonal rejection that completely breaks your heart. And this has happened to me a lot. This is what happened to everybody who wrote books in this library. I hope that makes us value those books more because every single book in this library was once just somebody's dream, somebody's pencil sketch on a napkin. And it represents a dedication. Some would say an obnoxious refusal to accept rejection. Every book. I love that. It's one of the wonderful things about publishing. I have had a couple of successes which have kept me going, which Pam was so kind to mention. Pam was so kind to mention some awards. Um, I got a wonderful literary agent who is helping me make my books better and pitching them to publishers. And I've had a couple of opportunities like this one where I get to speak to people and hang my art on people's walls. And so that's kept me going in the hard trenches of publishing. And I'm gonna continue to try and I'll keep y'all posted. Um, one last note before I do the demo. Um, over there, you'll see my recent work hanging on the wall. And then what I kind of like about this exhibition is those display cases. The one on the left, the one that's closer to this stack of books, is all my childhood work, which is vaguely embarrassing, 
but I want you to see it. Um, it, it has all of my high school, elementary school, middle school, and even some younger than that work in there. Um, terrible spelling, bizarre color and composition choices, just very strange. But I hope that young artists will go and look at those and feel encouraged because when I made those things at seven and 10 and 16, I would compare it to professionals and be really discouraged. Um, but part of my continuing to try and publishing is because I stuck it out then because I look back at that work that is not great and is kind of embarrassing. And I say, well, those were steps. Those are steps forward and you get better. You keep trying and you get better. And I'm gonna continue to keep trying because I don't feel like I've arrived. I don't think I'll ever have arrived, but I am better than I was yesterday. And that's really encouraging. And I hope you will look at that as artists and be encouraged. Anybody have any questions before I jump into the demo? You like my sweater? Thank you. I like it too. My sister told me to wear pink. That's what I'm doing. I trust her style choices. I'm glad it worked. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in here. Um, bear with us as we work out some tech things. Ready to start? Oh, can they hear me? Should I make it close? Oh my. Hello. Y'all can hear me. Y'all can hear me. Okay. So one of the features I wanted to talk about today is going from pencil and paper to digital. So early on in my career, early on, hello early on in my career, and I'm, by career, I mean childhood, I started um, with watercolor and crayon and pencil and kind of whatever my mom would buy me, which is pretty common. Um, and then that was my medium. When I got a little older, I really stuck with watercolor, pen and ink and pencil, just that's it. And then as I got older, I decided to switch over to digital because of the speed. Um, it really increases your speed and, and also you can change it, which is pretty important when you have people telling you to change it and you have to do that. <laughs> so um, right now I'm just gonna start with a sketch. And this is where kind of all my stories start is sketching. Sometimes it's a phrase, sometimes it's just a character. Kind of the theme I want to go with today is summer, end of summer, because we're at the end of summer, and reading, um, and nature. Those are my three, three themes of the day to work on. And uh, typically at the beginning, typically at the beginning of a process, this idea is not very clear. Um, it's not very well formed. Um, it's very conceptual. So sketching and, and writing helps me clarify it. For the purposes of this demonstration, I've obviously thought about what I want to draw today. So you're not gonna see all of the erasing and the crumbling up of paper. 
I'm just not going to do that to you. But know that this is a fast forwarded process. So don't think that it takes me five minutes to come up with this story. It really doesn't. Here we go. So you might ask why I would start with sketching when I could just sketch it on the computer. Um, but one of the things I really like about sketching is I can hold in my hand something that is going to be the same size as the book that it might end up being printed at. So I want to know exactly how much space is taken up by the character and the scene so that's not overwhelming. I'm going to be drawing on an eight and a half and 11, roughly eight and a half by 11 square. A lot of my sketching is just finding. It's, it's still very much exploring. FYI, this is really hard to do with all of you watching. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're not able to see it? Can you, can you see? Yes, ma'am, I will try to do that. So for my end of summer theme, I am trying to draw a child in a tree reading. And the phrase that has popped into mind is just one more minute, just one more minute. And I like this because it could have a lot of different meanings. When you write a, a children's book, a picture book in particular, but you don't illustrate, what they always tell you, the editors, the agents, they say, leave room for illustration. So you don't want to tell the whole story in the text, and you don't want to tell the whole story in the illustration. They have to work together. So just one more minute could mean so many different things. It could mean just one more minute of finishing this book, very literal term. It could mean just one more minute of summer because it's over, just one more minute of childhood, super deep, but it, it's relevant. And so I'm going to put this end of the day scene. It's going to be a fading sunlight scene. So this child is about to be in a tree. If you can't see it yet, you're going to see it very clearly when I go digital, which is in just a minute. Okay, now we're going to get to this really janky part, but this is actually how I do it right now. So I get my phone out. And I take a picture and I send it to myself on my computer. This will stop 
others yes okay photoshop share is this not going to work okay Put it on the other side. Okay, that's a good idea. Still working? Great. So I've just sent this to myself. And I'm going to paste it on top of. My top layer. It's really important to work in layers in Photoshop. And here is my janky sketch. It's perfect. So a lot of times I spend weeks perfecting a sketch before I put it in here. For this one, for the purposes of just keeping this moving and making sure you get to see the whole process from start to finish, I am just doing a very rough sketch, which means I'm going to do, I'm gonna have it be more of a guide rather than the final thing, rather than the final thing. I'm not going to be able to narrate every single keystroke. I apologize. I'm not going to be able to narrate every single keystroke and setting here. But if you have questions, please feel free to email me or, you know, raise your hand and ask. Um, and then this is being recorded. Yes, this is being recorded. So you can go back and watch this um, and kind of pause the areas where you'd like to see more detail of what happens. All right, so I've got my, my sketch here. I've turned it to multiply. And that just helps me to have it on top before I start coloring. This is my little color area, HSB, hue, saturation, and blacks. That helps me to get the color that I want really quickly. All right, so I'm not super careful when I start just basic coloring. What I'm putting in here now is local color. Let's go a little grayer. Yeah. You'll see me change my mind a lot, even though I have done this in preparation for our time. I'll still change my mind a lot based on what I'm seeing. Because it's never perfect. It will never be perfect even when it's finished. A lot like painting, you want to kind of start with your backgrounds. And I'm going to do the tree first, and then I'll do my, my sky in the back. No, nope. I don't like that. Oh, thank you very much, Emma. So um, Emma encouraged me to talk about a little bit what, um, what technology I'm using, which is really important. So thank you for asking that. Um, I am on a MacBook Pro. I'm running Photoshop. I'm using a Wacom tablet. It's an Intuos Pro. I don't actually know if that's how you say Intuos, but I think it is. We'll see. Um, with it, and this is a little, a little digital pen. It took me a lot of practice, very frustrating to switch from analog to digital, um, but YouTube is an amazing free resource. So if you ever wanna learn something, you can pretty much Google it and you can find a video on how to do it. It works for fixing your car too. Okay, so I'm putting another layer here because I wanna do this little branch behind her. 
And when things move farther away from you, they're gonna get both lighter and less saturated. So that's what I'm doing. See that color is a little bit different. Just wanna give it some depth. One of the things you won't see, but is very important to learn when you're learning digital is keystrokes. That speeds up your process so much. Um, you, can, you can Google keystrokes. And so, for example, whenever I want to switch to brush, I just press B, brush. Or I switch to eraser, I, switch, I, I choose E. Um, here's a wonderful tool that I use often to just check kind of where I'm at and make sure my shapes are good is um, a keystroke I put in, which is Command H, and it flips the canvas for you. And what's great about that is then I can see, oh, I don't, I don't know if I like that, but I'm cool with it for now. So I'm gonna leave it. Work on this sky here. I'm using a gradient that I already built, this little guy, to guide me on the sky. This is cheating, but this is a great way to start. So I have my sky. I'm gonna work on that a little bit more later. And you'll see as I keep going, I'm gonna lighten and lighten my original sketch to get it out of the way. So we've got our tree, we've got our back branch, we've got our little gradient background sky, which I'll work on more in a little bit. And now I've got a new layer for my girl. Now, I want her to have a similar skin tone to my kids, but it needs to not be so similar to the tree that she gets lost because we do want her to stand out. And this is all adjustable later, which is another wonderful thing about being digital, is I can go back and make her or the tree any kind of different adjustments that I need. Again, I'm not being super careful. I really just want to show you a full process. Color blocking. If I didn't say that, all right, I'm putting color blocks, which is there's no texture, there's no shadow, there's no highlights. I'm just getting the color on the page. There's no clothes either. I'll put her clothes on in a minute. Now you'll see I'm giving her, she has black hair, but I'm not gonna go full black because then there's nowhere to go for the shadows. So I wanna do just kind of like a partial black. It'll still look black to the, to the eye, but you wanna leave room for your highlights and shadows. And we'll do the same thing with white. I'm gonna give her a white shirt, but I'm gonna actually make it gray, a little gray. Try to stay zoomed out as much as you can when you're doing digital, because if you get too caught up in the details, when you do finally zoom out, you'll be like, oh, not good. Right now I'm zoomed in so I can make sure that I kind of stay in the lines, kind of. Photoshop comes built in with a lot of fabulous brushes. So that's what I'm using, some brushes that I downloaded on Photoshop and then kind of adjusted to what I wanted them to look like. Let's give her red shorts. Looking good so far. Checking on her shape, yep. All right. We'll do, we're gonna do leaves, but well, that'll be one of the last things we do. So for her, I'm gonna start with a secondary color. So I wanna do my shadows on her first, just basic shadows. So I'm gonna take with the eyedropper tool, her color of her skin that I already have, and just darken it just a little bit. So now I have this beautiful new color where I'm going to kind of fill in where there should be some shadows. Typically it'll be kind of like 
where her skin meets her skin or the underside of her legs, bottom of her feet. All the normal shadows. A little bit under her nose, her ear. I'm gonna go ahead and lighten my original sketch again. So I'm just barely able to see it. Looks pretty rough, but don't worry. Same thing with the white of the eyes. Although they will be the brightest thing on the page, which is, a, is intentional. You want to, the eyes of your character to be one, you know, the pretty much the first thing you see. This tells you a lot about what's happening in the scene. Is she scared? Is she angry? Is she sad? Is she tired? That's all in the eyes. So, you know, the eyes are going to be, it's okay that they're the brightest thing. Actually, her shirt is the brightest, but go with the eyes. Her pupils are brown. She's going to have really big pupils because in kid lit children's literature, the eyes are typically very large, as is the head, a little bit, a little bit bigger than normal life. And you'll see even when kids draw that they do the same thing unintentionally. Their head, huge heads and huge eyes and like two little tiny bodies, if there's any body at all. That's how kids draw. And so I think that's kind of where as adult artists, we come up with this, that's too much. This big eyed, big head thing is is that that's what interests kids. That's what that's what they do. Yeah, that's better. I'm gonna give her a book. A little darker. All of this will be adjusted later when we finish the lighting. So we want to make a cohesive scene, and the light affects everything in the scene. The book, her eyes, her hair, her shirt. And it's a fading sunset, so we want to be sure. Let's clean that up just a little bit. See me using the eyedropper tool a lot just to keep the color consistent. And the eyedropper, remember, is to take the color that I have and use it again, just like a palette when you're painting. All right, let me get some more facial features in here. I'm gonna give her her glasses. That's for you, Pam. Glasses. Glasses. Ooh, whoops. Control Z is back. Or delete rather. I do that a lot. Control Z is your best friend. Give her some eyebrows. Not, not that much eyebrows. All right, we're gonna once again decrease the visibility of our original sketch. She's starting to look like a human. So the shadows that I put on her skin, we're doing the same thing with her clothes. I grabbed the red from her, oops, no, 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 no. Grab the red from her shorts, go a little bit darker. And then I'm gonna do this wonderful thing. This little thing here is called a pixel lock. So I can shade and not have to stay in the lines because it only allows me to paint on what I've already painted. Starting to add some, some shadows now. Let's fix this arm a little bit. All right, let's do the same thing to the tree. Grab that color, darken it down a little bit. Pixel lock.
I'm gonna shade underneath her because obviously anywhere she's sitting, there's gonna be a shadow. Then I'm also gonna give the tree some general, just sort of color and texture to make it appear a little bit less digital in terms of like, do you remember the first Toy Story? And then, so if you've seen like Toy Story 4, you see how much better illustration has gotten. But Toy Story 1, if you go back and watch it, you're like, oh, people are looking kind of weird and creepy. That's what I'm trying to avoid here is that kind of like eerie digital look. This is supposed to look more like traditional illustration, but just a lot easier because you can change it. So I'm just adding a little texture, a little color here and there, make it look just sort of more like a tree. Same thing with this back branch, pixel lock, too dark. I'm going to use one of my favorite brushes, the spatter tool, because it literally splatters your color around, like splattering a paintbrush. And I find that that's the easiest way to give texture is just sort of splatter on some color. It looks sort of organic, it's sort of what you would expect to see. It's random. Lines. Let's do some lighter, a little lighter than that. Same thing with the back branch. And I'll eventually merge the back branch and the front branch, but I still just want to make sure I have complete control over what that back branch looks like. Because it is important. Otherwise, she's kind of hanging out in space. But this way, it's like, yes, this is a tree. We got it. So we're going to do some leaves now. I went ahead and created uh, a, a while ago some what I call foliage brushes so that I don't have to go through and draw each individual leaf. I can just draw these wonderful. There we go. I can just press a little press down a little bit on that and it creates my bunch of leaves. Make it really big. And we wanna vary the color a little bit too so it looks more natural. That's too many leaves. Let's go some darker too. And with the back branch again, lighter and less saturated. Oh, I don't want to do the pixel thing. And smaller too. And the last thing for the leaves, one of my favorite things, is the ones that are the closest up. So I make them really big really dark and really saturated, bigger than that. No, not that big. No, you don't want to cover up. There we go. Now this, these leaves I'm putting on their own layer because you'll see in just a second. Okay, a little bit of what I like to call movie magic, which is ridiculous, but I still really love it. Blur, gouache and blur, gaussin. I don't know how to say that, I'm not gonna lie. So you blur it and it looks like it's closer to you. Um, so pretty. I'm gonna darken that down too. So I'm gonna press Command L, which is your, your levels, and you can kind of darken down. Levels is a representation of the true blacks and the two true whites. True whites on this side, true blacks on that side. You darken down your blacks so that you get it darker. All right, so we have a basics, basic color here, and now I'm gonna go back and fix the background. 
the sunset layer here, you have this wonderful clouds brush. It's very big. And it's great for the sky. I'm going to grab the color there. I want to go a little bit darker to start with. Yes. So sun is fading. Mom is calling her in. I'm going to go even darker on the very top. And uh, because these are all in different layers, I don't have to do the sky first. And I can change it to a nice sunny day if I want to later which is one of the, the best things about digital. I'm grabbing each part of the color. That's why I put it down is to kind of guide my guide myself later. And then I gotta get this orange. And then kind of lighten it. It makes it make it a little bit more yellow. So we pretend like we've got the sun kind of maybe coming down a little, a little bit at the end. Maybe the sun is, is Hello. Let's go ahead and get rid of our original sketch. Bye bye. I can get rid of that one and not see it anymore. All right, so we have this basic piece here. I'm going to go ahead and darken down the tree. So I'm using each layer now and I'm going to go and kind of adjust because it is getting dark. So the tree is gonna be darker. The back branch is gonna be darker. The girl is gonna be darker, but she needs to be more saturated. So command U is actually hue and saturation. You can adjust just that layer. Levels again. There, I like that, I like that. Okay, so we're in a good place. Might do a little bit more tree down. Now we're gonna do more specific highlights and shadows, especially on her. Um, I would do it on every single layer, but we probably don't have time for that. So I'm creating, ooh, not that, a new layer above and a clipping mask. Let's do the shadows on her first. Now the shadows are gonna pick up the darkest part of your piece. I'm gonna go get my brush again. This is my favorite brush right now. Changes all the time. So I'm using this green, oh, too dark. I'm using this green. I'm gonna to have to be very unsaturated. Green is our nice dark shadow. And see, it affects each color differently, which is kind of cool. You know, it even turns your white shirt a little green. It's gonna turn her skin a little more brown. Anywhere there's normally shadows and, and there's shadows everywhere because she's in a tree, but we do want to, even if it's artificial, we do want to make sure her face is still the first thing you see when you turn to this page. So her face is going to be just kind of kept lit, kept well lit. No, I don't like that. There we go. Okay, same thing. Another layer and another clipping mask for the, sh for the highlights. And you see I'm blending them differently. This is the blend of how this layer is going to interact with the other layers. And we're going to, same as when you're making the shadows, you choose the darkest part. When you're making the highlights, you choose the lightest part. So I'm going to choose this nice yellow here. There we go. She's going to kind of get that on her face. It takes a couple tries sometimes to make sure the shadow looks kind of, or the highlights look kind of like they should. Sometimes they, won't cooperate. Don't want it on her hand, just her face. Her hair, her other part of her hair. These are, this brush is intended to build on itself. So the first pass over is kind of light. And then after that, you get like a lot brighter. A little tad bit on her nose, just a little. Now, again, you're in the fast, we're, we're fast forwarding, but um, 
I would go in and put the light in her eyes with individual brush strokes. I would go put the light in the leaves, which I can do a little bit of right now. Make sure that's the right layer. Yep. You can turn off visibility. See, eye leaves. Pixel lock, darken down the leaves just a little bit on the top because the light's coming from the bottom. So you want to let's do a little darker. Oh, it's the opacity of the brush. So this is going to create some variation and interest in your leaves and also reflects the fact that they are on the top. So they're going to be darker than the ones on the bottom because we were in a sunset. Nice, okay. Okay, so before I add the final special touches, I'm gonna add an adjustment layer, which will change the entire piece just with a couple of little strokes, which is great. And it helps it to be more cohesive. We are almost done. Now I'm gonna go and add some fun things real quick. I'm gonna put some stars right at the top there where it's really starting to become nighttime. And I need to put that layer on the very back, otherwise it will be stars on the trees. So I'm gonna put it right there. It's just a little bit of like extra delightful magic. Even though stars in and of themselves are not magical, it does kind of make it look special, exciting. If I had more time, I would add like maybe an owl watching her somewhere or a squirrel. Just a couple of that. And then we're going to do one more thing. And I know I keep saying we're almost done, but we really, really are this time. We're gonna just add a couple of little fireflies to really bump up the whole magical factor. Mom is calling her, she's saying, one more minute, just one more minute. Fireflies are coming out to join her and figure out what she's doing. I'm varying the size of these because some are closer, some are farther away. Fireflies look the best at kind of like a blue green sometimes like neon yellow. I'm just using a big, broad, soft brush for this. Very last thing. She's gonna be named Michaela. Let's do gray. Oops, that is the wrong thing. Here's my text. And there you have it, picture book. Questions? I know it was a lot. Thank you. Somebody said it was beautiful. I'm gonna take that. I have been working digitally for four years, I think, ish. All the pictures on the wall are digital. Yes. I am using Photoshop, um, whatever the current version is with Creative Suite, Adobe Creative Suite. There are a lot of other less expensive um, 
digital drawing apps. Um, there's one for the iPad called Procreate. It's 10 bucks. And so that's a really great place to start. You have to have an iPad, which is not 10 bucks. <laughs> Oh my goodness. The question was, how many books do I have to have published in order to quit my day job? Four, maybe, <laughs> which is a lot. Life of an artist. I'm cool with that though. And we have an online question. Favorite child's book author and Daniel asked. Daniel asked, favorite child's children's book author. Um, it changes all the time. Right now, my very favorite, who I adore, picture book author and illustrator is Dan Santat. He wrote um, Beagle and Drawn Together and um, a lot of other just wonderful books that are really heartfelt and gorgeous illustrations. So I encourage you to go and look at those because I borrow them all the time just so I can be inspired. Um, but another one of my favorite illustrators is Vashti Harrison. She just draws these gorgeous women with their gorgeous hair and they're always doing something magical. So check her out too. She wrote Soul Way. S-U-L-W-E, beautiful book. Please go check that out too. That inspires me a lot is just to sit in the children's area and look at these books that just came out and say, okay, this is what people want and are inspired by. So it's, 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 there's no shame in copying, but, or not copying, but being inspired by other artists is a very real part of the creative process. Dan Santat, S-A-N-T-A-T. He's Filipino and he draws just magic. Yes, ma'am. So the question was, um, knowing the difficulty of publishing in general, how do I keep going and what inspires me to keep going? Um, some of it is grit. <laughs> like, I just, I don't want to quit yet. I'm not ready to quit. Someday I might quit. And if you see me on the street and you're like, did you quit? Then you can like slap me on the face. But I'm hoping I'm not going to quit. Um, what keeps me going is the artists that I see that are being published, they, they get their first book and it's their debut book. And everybody talks about, oh, this debut author is so talented. I'm like, dude, they've been working for 25 years on that craft, okay? It's a debut author, but it took them a long time to get there. So I'm not worried that it's taking a long time. Um, when it gets really discouraging, I just try to think about what I wanted out of it, which was to give a little bit of a voice to families like mine. And to get books out there that are a little bit more variety. This online question about how do you make your custom brushes for the leaves? The question was, how do I make my custom brushes for the leaves? Um, the, uh, I would say YouTube that. Uh, that's what I did in order to make the brush. Um, you, you like make a shape save it as a file and then you kind of like define it and it creates a brush for you. And, and you kind of have to play around with it. It doesn't work the first time the way you think that it will. Um, but with the leaves um, scattering, turning on the scattering option really helps because you'll put down your imprint and then the next time you put down your imprint, it changes it for you. So it's not always the same imprint. It kind of like rotates it or it flips it or it adds texture. Um, there's a, endless options for that, but YouTube is your best friend. How long have I been doing digital art? About four years-ish. I just started and it was very frustrating. So if you're just starting and you think you're never gonna get it, you really just need to keep trying. And, and, and at the very beginning, straight up copying somebody else's YouTube video painting of a rock is the way to go. You'll learn so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, the question was, the gallery pieces all say that the medium was digital and watercolor and pencil. And she asked if I, 
in the sketching process if I do watercolor first before I transfer it to the computer. And yes, it really depends on how I want this thing to look. Because one of the great things about Photoshop is that you can add texture later. Or if my original sketch was really quality, um, I would paint it and then bring it in and then just more enhance it rather than draw over it. Um, and a lot of those are watercolor enhanced in Photoshop. Yes, ma'am. The question was, she is assuming that it's advantageous to go digital and she wanted to know what, why I went digital. Um, once I got my agent, she was an editorial agent, which means she wants to make changes before she pitches it to her publishers. So she would let me spend six months working and I'd send it to her. And in two days, she'd be like, great, change this, all this. And I'm like, okay. So instead of starting over at the beginning with sketching, <laughs> digital allowed me to go in here and say, okay, not a nighttime scene, a daytime scene with the sun. And maybe there's two people in the tree and a bird. And there's, you know, like you can just do that. But on the traditional format, you can't really do that. You have to start over. So that's kind of where digital came in. And so what are the disadvantages of digital is it is not as relaxing. <laughs> uh, the experience for the user is you're on another screen. Um, that's not great. You know, painting's very relaxing. Um, painting on here, at least for me, is not that relaxing. It's work. Um, I, I don't know when that happened, but it did. Yes, ma'am. So how do you back up your work from <laughs> How do I back up my work so it stays with me forever? I make multiple copies. So uh, Creative Suite backs it up for me. And then I have an offsite hard copy storage of like a huge two terabyte hard drive in my in my house. So we have Creative Suite and then the hard drive in my house. And then I also have Backblaze. It's a wonderful backup service. So three copies. And I have actually needed all three of them at different times. So it really has saved my bottom more than once. Backblaze, hard copy, and Creative Suite. Do you have a copyright question for um, how, The question was, how do I keep people from copying my work? Um, I don't really, I, I don't share the books in progress. That's not allowed. If a publisher sees that you have shared work beforehand, they don't want your book because technically you've already published it as soon as it goes online. So if you're working on something special, you do not share that. Um, so what you see on my Instagram is just like me practicing. Um, it's not anything that I'm working on to be published. And um, people do steal, but honestly, there are billions of people out there putting their work online they're going to get stolen. We're going to get stolen. It happens. We have time for one more question. We do have to close it out, though. Liz will be here at the end if anyone wants to come and talk to her. The question was, when did I know I want to do, do illustration? I have always wanted to do illustration, um, but full transparency, I have a day job that pays the bills. And I highly recommend that because getting an agent, getting awards, even getting published maybe once or twice or even three times is not gonna pay the rent. Um, so like a practical artist, I love illustrating and I have not stopped illustrating, but you still gotta work. So um, thank you very much for being with us today. I have to hold my, both mics at the same time and um, sharing how you create your beautiful illustrations. Um, I, my favorite part, of course, was the little girl in the tree because that was me at seven years old. So it's like she just went into my past and drew me there. Um, the, got a couple of things to say, I'm sorry. The library lecture series is just one of the many programs Leon County Public Library um, hosts throughout the year. And I would like to invite all of you back to some of our programs as well as our virtual pro programs. You can go online and see what we have to offer. Um, 
before you leave, please don't forget to stop by and see her work and as well as what's in the cases because it is amazing. Uh, let's say, okay. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful Saturday afternoon.